past few weeks, with the personal testimonies and through our small group Bible studies, I have felt that deep connectional fellowship as described in 1 John chapter 1. The third verse states, We declare to you that we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. We have seen and heard some of our members' struggles, and through it all, the truth is God, that God has been with them, and God has been with us. It is that joy of knowing that through our darkness comes God's light, redeeming us from our sins. Back to that fellowship. I don't know about you, but there have been parts of the testimony that have let me know that my personal struggles are not totally unique. Our concerns and fears are not unique. As I was reflecting on the passages for this morning, it felt like in John 20, 19 through 29, we really have two groups of people. There are the ten disciples who happened to be all be present when Jesus appeared to them. <coughs> and then there is the one disciple, Thomas. Poor Thomas always considered the doubter. Really, Thomas was just asking the same proof for the same proof that the other disciples got without asking. Which group do you resonate with? Are you one who didn't have to ask? There may never have been a time in your life when you didn't know God and Jesus were real. You didn't have to seek proof or verification to help you believe because you were shown without asking. Or, like Thomas, do you believe, or maybe you're skeptic, looking for the nails in his hands, the tangible evidence that he exists as our risen savior. Just remember, the 10 were shut up in their room, cowering with fear. They had fellowship, yes, but they were locked in place. Yet Thomas was outside, coming and going. Perhaps he was given the short straw for food runs, or perhaps he was looking for something else. Not fully in fellowship, not feeling connected, or like he really belonged with the other ten. We don't know, but we do know that Jesus came back to him and gave him his proof. He also reminded them and us that there are others, Jesus also reminded them and us that there are others outside when he states, Blessed are those who have not yet seen and yet have come to believe. <coughs> Finally, through the grace of Jesus, he unlocked the disciples' fears and can unlock our fears too. This is a story we've heard repeatedly over the last few weeks and will continue to hear till the end of the ages. As Jesus states, peace be with you. As part of the hands of poverty, I have a bit of a confession to make, and that is that quite honestly, the church was meeting my needs, and I didn't really know what we could change or why we would have to change after all. It was all about me and my needs. But through um, the hand plow process and some of the readings that we've been doing, I've had lots of aha sorts of moments. And I just want to share with you a couple of passages from one of the books that we read called Renovate or Die. And as I sat in the pews and was feeling quite good about hearing sermons and singing hymns and then joining the, the choir um, and feeling that my needs were being fulfilled, um, I was missing something because I watched as pews began to empty and, and as finance chair I knew that our coffers were also becoming a little emptier than they were. So it, one of the passages in this book, Renovate or Die, says, we simply can't just redecorate, even though that's what most churches are hoping to do when they go off to find the magic silver bullet that will bring back all of the people and bring back the great church culture from the 1950s and 60s and 70s when the pews were full and there was lots of rejoicing. 
But it goes on to say that the former times have passed away. What was will no longer be and isn't coming back. We're going to have to sacrifice some of our ways of doing things and some of our personal preferences for the sake of those who we don't know yet. Those who we don't know yet? What could this possibly be about? Certainly, it's not just about me, I guess. So one of the very um, important tools in the church's toolkit for making renovations and bringing people back to the church is the congregation. In fact, it's probably the most important piece because if you consider congregations, the ones that you've been part of all of your life, suppose how somehow you could extract <coughs> all of the influences that these congregations have ever had on you. Imagine that you could pull out of your mind and heart all the thousands of sermons, the thousands of hymns, all the pastoral prayers, the personal devotions that you've experienced in churches. Remove all the people whom you've come to know and learn from and work alongside. The pastors, the friends, the colleagues, the lay persons, Sunday school teachers. Take out the work projects, the service initiatives, the community dinners, the coffee hours, the mission trips, the meetings, the conversations, the prayer groups, the study groups, and all of the support that you've gotten from others. If you could remove from your life all of those influences, who would you be? What would be left? You'd probably be somebody totally different than you are right now, because the congregations have been, uh, the, that you have been a part of have shaped you. So how do we make um, this a congregation that brings new people in? How do we look at our processes and think of new things? One of the um, suggestions in this book is that congregations that are able to do that um, embrace extraordinary risk and change in order to shift from declining ministry to increased fruitfulness. They reach out to new people and make room for those people to express their ministries and offer lead their leadership. They display as much passion and care for those outside the congregation as they do for those already present. And there's my aha moment. It's not about those of us sitting in the seats. It's about those of us who aren't sitting in our seats. And how to make that happen is part of what has tied me all up in knots. process, we were asked the question, if your church closed its doors, would it matter to the community? This was right about the time that the Episcopal Church um, closed, where there were rumors that the church was going to close. And across the street sat another empty church. And I think this really resonated with me because my mother um, was Episcopalian, and um, one Sunday a month, we went to her church and then three Sundays to the Lutheran church um, in town. So it, it got, got me thinking. And we certainly would feel the impact, the loss of fellowship, the loss of support we get from one another. We'd have less hugs in our lives, less opportunities for spiritual growth. I know I would certainly miss all that. But what about the wider community? Some people would miss our community dinners, um, our rummage sale, our donations to the food bank, um, families at holidays. Our dresses certainly would be missed by girls across the world. But how long would anybody miss us? I think the hand of plow process gives us the opportunity to reach our community to expand our outreach, to bring others to the fellowship, the support, the personal and professional, not professional, spiritual growth. Um, and most important in my mind is the love of God for all his people and the difference that can make in our lives. And I think the videos that we watched the last few weeks really 
um, bring that home to us that that really makes a difference in people's lives. Um, so the hand to plow process um, hopefully will help us, as Mary said, find those people that aren't in the pews and bring them to what we have now and can expand. achieve its greatest expression, it must come completely undone. The shell cracks, its insides come out, and everything changes. To someone who doesn't understand growth, it would look like complete destruction. The most eye-opening thing for me in the hand to plow study phase has been the idea of designing services that will speak to the people who have not yet walked through the door. Similar to Mary, this was an idea that just blew my mind. That requires all of us to examine everything about our church and, and the services and the services we provide through the lens of does this actually serve the teachings of Jesus? Or is it merely, does it merely serve the ideas of what make me comfortable and happy? So many of the things that I think of fondly when I think of church, and I've grown up in the church my whole life, but a lot of the things I think of when I think about how much I love the church, and I mean, very honest here, they're traditions, not unlike the kinds of traditions that we develop in our families around Christmas that maybe have nothing to do with Christmas. Maybe we always have a gingerbread house and it just wouldn't be Christmas without a gingerbread house. Or we have a certain thing we put on the tree and it just and like that, I think we have developed a lot of traditions in the church that are wonderful in and of themselves, and they serve us, and they make us feel loved and included. But when you look at it through the lens of, would this have meant anything to Jesus, and does it have anything to do with bringing a God connection to someone who's never felt it yet? Well, that's a question, and, and it's a tough one. Because we all hate change. The, the worst times in our life, if you think about it, have been because something changed and we didn't want it to change. Now I, as all of us, are starting to think about every custom of, of for me, the music, um, stories, even, even dress, and ask ourselves, or myself, does this have anything to do with, or would it mean anything, to Jesus and to his children waiting to come in? Or is it just a beloved tradition for those of us raised in the traditional church? I think this may be the most difficult part of this process for us. I'm sure it will be for me. But I'm at the same time, I'm very excited about it. I'm excited about what rethinking everything could mean for us and how it will not only serve the people waiting to come in, but refresh our own connections to Jesus. I look very much forward to working with you to find the balance. What have I gleaned from the hand of plow process? One of the things that I've learned in this process is that the work you do in the church should be one of your strengths. Well, let me tell you, public speaking is not one of my strengths. 
I should be in the kitchen cooking with Tony or singing Alpo in the choir, so please bear with me while I stumble through. Through the hand of cloud process, we have been assigned several books to read. Books that have geared us to look at our faith and church with fresh eyes and open minds. I certainly have come to look at my faith in a different way. I've always gone to church, I was raised to go to church, and it has always been a part of me. But at times, it has been nothing more than emotion I have just gone through, not unlike going to work or going to the store. Hand to Plow is open by mind and heart to Jesus to become a disciple, not just a member of a church, but a disciple of Jesus. Now I want to share this with others, with those who don't know the peace, love, the work, and the fulfillment that comes from being a disciple of Jesus. With all that being said, I have charged myself to look at our physical church and to make sure that it is friendly and inviting to someone that has never been to church or attends infrequently. What makes our church inviting? We have friendly folks, for the most part, beautiful stained glass windows, and several doors. So you pull into the parking lot as a newcomer, and you wonder which door to go in. I did this myself about 10 years ago, and I felt very uncomfortable. I had door number one, door number two, door number three, and so on. Do we need a greeter in the parking lot? Then we get inside, and depending on which door you've come through, there are more doors. We now have signage that I'm sure is very helpful, but could we do more? What I would like you all to think about is if you were new here, could you maneuver through our church and feel comfortable? Is it inviting and conducive to a holy, inspiring experience? Should we be more formal? Should we be more informal? How about cup holders in the pews? <laughs> Seriously, I would like to all I would like you all try to imagine how you would feel if you were new to our church. Do you think you would be comfortable and able to be ready to worship? Are there things that we could change or rearrange that would make the newcomer more comfortable and anxious to join us and be a disciple of Jesus? Perhaps we should engage our new attendees to see if they have suggestions. Let's never stop thinking and praying about ways to be more supportive, enduring, and welcoming to people who have come to our church to learn and worship Jesus.
In, clo in closing, we're going to, I'm sorry. If you would pray with me as I say the knot prayer and you can untie those, work on untying those knots on your string and in your heart. Dear God, please untie the knots that are in my mind, my heart, and my life. Remove the have-nots, the can-nots, and the do-nots that I have in my mind. Erase the will-nots, may-nots, and might-nots that find a home in my heart. Release me from the could-nots, would-nots, and should-nots that obstruct my life. And most of all, dear God, I ask you that you remove from my mind, my heart, and my life all of the am-nots that I have allowed to hold me back, especially the thought that I am.